Welcome, hello. Thank you for coming today. My name is Taylor Wilson, and I'll be talking a little bit about building an auto remediation platform for the cloud, subtitled, Take Advantage of All Your CSPMs. Uh, real quick, just a minute about who I am. Uh, again, my name is Taylor Wilson. I got a degree from UVU in technology management. I think it's a sort of a sleeper degree, right? It's kind of a hidden degree. It's, it's a great fit for a lot of us in information security. Um, it's crossed between business and IT uh, with a little bit more in project management than like an information systems degree. Um, Career-wise, I did sysadmin work for a few years, security focused. I was the new guy on the team at the time and they're like, hey, there's this new thing, it's called security, why don't you go ahead and learn that for us so we don't have to, and that's how I ended up in the security side of things. Um, from the security side, the last six years, I've been, I've been doing just security full time and uh, cloud security as well. Uh, that's as a cloud security engineer or architect or now, now director of engineering and architecture at NewSkin just down the street here. Um, disclaimer. I'm definitely AWS biased just because that's what I use the most and it's what lives in my brain, right? Uh, all of the terms that I'll use as specific examples, a specific application are AWS focused, but they work across, the, the, the principle is the same everywhere, including any other cloud that you use that isn't listed here, right? Um, let's see, thesis, right? What I'm talking about. I say thesis because I think it makes me sound smarter than I am. But it's get value from all your CSPM tools by creating your own automated central remediation system. It's easier than it sounds, right? And that's what we're talking about today. It's, it's pretty easy to extract value from all these sources of cloud security posture management that you probably already have today. Uh, by show of hands real quick, who has cloud workloads deployed at their, at their company or personally? Anyone who doesn't is fooling yourself because you, you do, everyone does. Um, real quick, InfoSec control types, right? I categorize a lot of these into just two simple buckets. There are preventative controls and detective controls. Preventative, of course, being you prevent a, in this case, I'll be talking about a bad cloud configuration for being pushed out through IAM, identity and access management, right? People only have permission to do exactly what you want them to, the way you want them to do it. Uh, service control policies are sort of settings you can set per cloud account to say, you know, we want things done this way. Or through uh, pre-deployment infrastructure as code scans, right? In a, in a CI job, you scan the things. Like, this, this looks good, it's good to go on, right? And then detective controls. You deploy it, then you assess it and say, is this, does this meet my policy or not? And those assessments you know, come in as alerts or risk, which you then remediate, either manually or hopefully automatically. Um, which would I rather have? Of course, preventative. In a perfect world, we would only need preventative controls. Every workload we would be deployed with zero misconfiguration, there'd be zero vulnerabilities as of when it's deployed or ever in the future, right? Of course, that's, we all know that's not what really happens. Um, but real quick, before we get into preventative versus detective, why do companies use cloud, right? It's like the thing, everyone's doing it these days. Um, I, know, I think it's important that we understand as information security professionals, um, the business value that cloud brings. Um, you're able to scale your costs with revenue. Right, you say, here's a service, it's pay per, per use. As more people use it, you're making more money. Your costs go up with your revenue, right? And they go down as revenue drops. Um, you can quickly onboard new technology. You can participate in more rapid innovation. I, I think of, um, for example, recently we had some devs say, hey, you know, this Kafka thing sounds great. Let's check it out for a little bit. In AWS, again, that's just my default mindset. But you go in, manage service for it, deploy it, you don't have to worry about the operating system, the hardware, um, all of your access patterns into any new technology that's provided by a cloud provider is a known access pattern, right? It's security groups or IAM. It just really lowers the barrier of entry. You know, two, two or three days later, they're, they're done figuring out what it's all about, they turn it off, costs like, you know, two or three dollars. Um, that's, that's real business value. And then developer efficiency, 
I think uh, we often underestimate the, the value of having devs close to their deployments. Um, their deployments are a simple infrastructure as code template. You push it out and it's there and it's deployed a few minutes later. Um, I think DevOps is a lot like zero trust, which in my, in my opinion is a journey, not a final destination, at least not usually. You're all, there's always a, a give and take, a push and pull, a little bit of balance that goes into uh, like what DevOps means for you. So with that in mind, let's circle back to our two control types, preventative and detective. In the real world, we, there will always need to be a balanced approach. You prevent the worst things from happening, but in order to get some of that value from the cloud for your company, you need to also have detective controls. There are some things you cannot prevent and some things that you'll just have to you know, detect and respond to. So prevent the worst things, respond to everything else. CSPM, I've mentioned it a few times already. Let's dig a little bit deeper into what that actually is. Uh, in InfoSec, we love acronyms, right? I mean, it's just like everything's abbreviated everywhere. Uh, what it is, cloud security posture management. It's a way to identify risk um, in the cloud of cloud configuration, right? It's the configuration of your cloud control plane. It's the configuration of resources as seen by your cloud provider, right? It's, it's anything that you could get to through the AWS web console, for example. So what it isn't is like vulnerability scanning of like your operating systems deployed in the cloud. It's not EDR, endpoint detection. It's not sec application security, although there's a case to be made that application security and cloud security are extremely related, and I've got another talk about that. Um, it, it sure is, but CSPM as a definition, cloud security, it, it'll identify misconfigurations, let you know about it. So I'm a very hands-on practical learner, so this is what helps me, right? Here are some example findings that you might get out of a CSPM tool. AMIs that are shared with an account that isn't yours, right? AMI being like a golden image of a virtual machine in the cloud. Uh, IEM role with overprivileged policy attached. You know, this role looks like it can do more than it should. Um, or an unencrypted RDS instance, just the database, right, in the cloud. So let's look at how we would prevent or detect these and sort of the level of effort required to prevent versus detect these things. Now I did handpick these examples to prove my point, of course, but uh, an AMI shared with an account that isn't yours, it is hard to prevent. You would, in order to prevent that, you would have to maintain a list of all of your approved accounts you can share with in every single policy in every single cloud account you have. Maybe it's doable if you have just a couple accounts, no big deal, and just a few policies and roles. But when you start operating at any kind of scale, that, that won't work, right? I mean, we operate at a relatively small scale in AWS and have 50 plus accounts that constantly churn a little bit, right? Um, the IEM example, a role with too many permissions. You could say centralize all IEM roles with one single team who knows exactly what they're doing and will always honor the principle of least privilege. Then you're slowing down your deployments, not getting value from the cloud. Um, you could try service or uh, permission boundaries in AWS, for example. That would require a change to every single deployment that goes into the cloud, which is, you know, we have thousands and thousands of workloads running. It would slow down, it'd be hard, it'd be hard, to, hard to prevent, easy to detect. Unencrypted RDS instances, same thing, right? Uh, very hard to prevent through like IEM conditions or service control policies. Easy to just see that it's been done wrong, go in and fix it. So the, the CSPM is the source of information that we can use to respond to security misconfigurations. Now, back in the olden days, right, when I first started doing cloud, which was just six years ago, um, we decided, hey, there's a new space. It's called Cloud Security Posture Management. We're in the cloud. Let's see what's out there. You used to go out, look for CSPM solutions, CSPM tools, do a vendor selection, proof of concept, et cetera, buy something, implement it, good to go. Today, every single security-adjacent, cloud-adjacent tool that's out there 
has some sort of, for free, we'll throw in some CSPN type findings, right? They're, they're all over the place. I mean, I was really surprised when like my, my uh, APM, application performance monitoring tool, it's like, hey, plus here's all the stuff about your cloud configuration. It's like, well, there are some good, there's some good data there. There's some good findings. Um, EDR tools, especially have those these days. Um, API security, it's like, some of my network stuff is surprising. The network, like NIDS tool, it's like, hey, and since we're here in your cloud looking at network stuff, we'll look around a little bit more and give you some good CSPM findings. So what we're talking, CSPMs, they really are a commodity. They're, they're something that everything has. There's all this valuable data out there and my, my thesis today is that we can take advantage, extract value from all of these solutions easier than you think it might be, right? Um, so how do we get value from all these things? Um, real quick, what a CSPM standard workflow might be, this is basically incident response in a lot of ways. Uh, you get an alert, you determine is, is that resource allowed to be an exception to the policy? There will always be exceptions as much as we might wish there weren't, uh, but it does make sense that there are, right? For example, um, we have some sandbox and lab AWS accounts. Back to the RDS encrypted database uh, alert from, from earlier, it costs more money to have encrypted RDS instances, right? And in our lab accounts, we have pretty strong guarantees of no personal data in there or sensitive data in those accounts. And so let's just save a few bucks and you know, allow our sandbox and lab accounts to not adhere to that rule. Um, so you'll always have an allow list to check. Then you'll do your response, right? Maybe you, you know, that's just fix the problem, whatever you define that to be, fix the problem. And then I'm a huge advocate for training, right? Identify who made the configuration that was flagged as being insecure and let them know how they can avoid that problem in the future, right? So, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, so we'll get to it then. Um, so diving a little deeper into the respond box there, you know, there's kind of four basic things that you do. You correct the resources con configuration, hopefully automatically. That's, you know, if I have an S3 bucket policy that allows unencrypted objects, I'll go in and change it to only allow encrypted objects. Uh, you can very often do that in the cloud uh, without any outage or downtime or incident. You could terminate the resource. Some resources in the cloud are difficult to adjust once live and kind of do require delete and redeploy. So you can terminate the resource only if you have a good training and alert to say, tell the person that deployed an S3 bucket, don't, the reason why it deleted itself after 10 seconds is because it wasn't secure and they need to change this. So you know, that one only works if you have some good training involved or automatic response to the end user who, who deployed it. And, or so, other response type, add something to the backlog, right? If a human needs to make a decision, it's more of a strategic direction, what do we do here? There's no established pattern to follow, send it to a backlog, right? We'll have like a GRC team or something, um, prioritize it, send it out to the right person, have that conversation with them. And always log these alerts for the SOC to correlate with other threat intel and other alerts, right? It's always good for them to know when I'm looking at this resource, what other alerts have been associated with this in the, in the past? Uh, getting a little bit more into the training side now of a CSPM response workflow. Uh, I'm a huge fan of just-in-time training, JIT. It's kind of a term from the manufacturing space that I think really applies well to a lot of InfoSec applications. Um, identify the violator, tell them what the problem was, what we did, you know, this was your old bucket policy, we changed it, this is the new one. Uh, tell them how they can avoid this problem in the future, right? And we send out infrastructure as code, you know, Terraform, serverless framework, CDK, whatever, um, CloudFormation. We send a snippet, say, if you put this code, use this configuration in your template, you can deploy as many buckets as you want and they'll, they'll always be compliant. And then uh, lastly, we always link to a security standard where they can just find out more. Like, why is this even important that we require encrypted objects in S3, right? Or also there'll be a, some like, if they, need, if they feel the need to petition for an exception from this rule or policy for that resource, give them instructions on how to, how to do that. Uh, we, we send these out just via like email because it's the simplest way, but you could easily 
do it through through your chat app or whatever. Um, so, so we've talked a little bit about what a standard workflow is for CSPM. Let's talk a little bit about that centralized remediation service. This is, in my experience, the best way to get value from all of those tools which have included and are starting to include increasingly more cloud posture management, cloud configuration findings uh, in, in their alerts. Collect all those sources, send them, have them send events into one single place, and do your response process from there, right? As a bonus, you can often handle a lot of the default uh, findings from your cloud provider, right? In AWS, it's, for example, Config or CloudTrail or Macy or whatever. Uh, the same system will often apply to, to those. Uh, you, you can handle them from, from the same centralized remediation system. Uh, do your exception policy management there, your response, and your JIT training. Um, now, you might ask, why, why would I not do that from the CSPM itself? Some, not all, not even most in my experience, some CSPM tools will have the ability to click a button and it will go into your cloud provider and make the change on your behalf. If you do that, you're missing out on a couple key steps to what I believe our remediation workflow should be, right? Um, you would need to maintain an, a list of exceptions in every single tool that has CSPM capabilities, right? Instead of one central place to say this resource is allowed to be exempt from this policy, you'd be stuck maintaining that allowed list in every single resource. That's expensive from an operational standpoint. Also, CSPM tools don't often, such I've yet to see it, uh, identify the user that made the change and have a nice training email sent to them at the time that they're that their uh, resource is remediated or changed. Um, in general, it feels like you have a lot less control if you're trying to leverage the built-in CSPM response functionality, um, as well as no centralized circuit breaker or you know on-off switch, kill switch. I imagine a large machine running, something's gone wrong, where's that big red button, you just slap it and it, and it turns off, right? Um, you know, maybe it's, some resource that is production critical is you know, being deleted right after it's deployed every time, it's, an, it's causing an issue. Do you want to look through all 5, 10, 20 of your CSPM sources to figure out which one's doing it or just have a centralized, let's just turn that off for now, figure it out, and go from there. So that's the advantage of a centralized service. Um, you might ask, how is this, what I'm proposing, different from like standard SOAR? It isn't, it's the same thing. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about doing it yourself versus doing it in a low code platform. Um, if you're doing it yourself, you of course have the ability to tailor it to exactly what you want. You can customize it to your heart's content. Um, I will say the people writing the code, if you do it yourself, um, often they only need a low level of coding experience. They don't need infosec experience as well, right? we as professionals can dictate what we want to happen and they can be enabled to make it happen in code the way they want. Um, which lowers the barrier of entry, right? It makes it easier to find people that are capable of writing these simple, simple scripts to do a centralized remediation platform. Um, around here especially, we have a lot of code boot camps or development boot camps. You can get junior devs out of there very affordably with excellent Node experience, Node.js, um, all of the colleges and universities in the area. I feel like Python is on every curriculum around here for a lot of different majors, and Python is a great language with, uh, to be able to interact with cloud APIs. Everyone has an SDK for it, it's quite simple. Um, I myself run an intern program where we have a revolving door of two, sometimes three interns come through, and that's what they get to work on is adding more rules and code to our centralized remediation service. Um, if you're doing it yourself, it's all serverless, so extremely cheap, right? And event-based, so you get very short response times between when the alert comes in from the CSPM tool and you've acted on it. It's, it's less than a couple pennies and happens within a few seconds usually. Doing it in a low-code platform is absolutely good enough. Like, 
you can make, you can extract a lot of value from your CSPM by doing the same general workflow in your low-code platform. It could be even your SOAR, which is tied to your SIM, your Security Incident Event Management tool. Um, lower barrier of entry in most cases. I will say some uh, SOAR platforms I've seen out there don't integrate very easily, at least in, the, in, in a secure manner with your cloud providers. Mo most of them do. S some of them have a little bit of a hard time with that. Uh, just in like credential management, you'd have to fall back to some sort of legacy authentication methods. But it certainly, yes, it could, it could be your SOAR. I mean, if you wanted to do it, yeah, you, you could do it in a lot of those low-code platforms, which are gaining popularity, and there's some, there's some certain advantages to, the, to those. I, and I will summarize again. It's easier than it seems. We'll get into that in just a minute here. I will say, learn from my mistakes. Avoid this pitfall. I was that poor lady falling into the hole there. Six years ago, a CSPM tool was a dedicated thing, and there wasn't budget for it. So I was, all right, well, we'll just do, I'll just do what I can with what I've got. And I'm not a programmer, but I hacked together a few scripts and made this, this system, and it, and it worked. But don't write your own evaluation logic. Use the evaluation logic built into all of your CSPMs, built into all of your cloud providers. They'll give you security alerts. Uh, don't try to say, I'm going to look at this S3 bucket and check all these things to make sure that it meets my standards. That's commodity. It, it's out there. Everyone's got it. Don't write your own, because then you're stuck maintaining your own. Um, unless the caveat there, of course, is if you have a very specific threat vector or you're using a cloud service in a very unconventional manner, which I've seen many a time, um, then sure, you can. It, it is easy to just add your own evaluation logic to say, anytime uh, whatever it is you're looking at is created, let me assess it and, and go through my own checklist to make sure it's compliant or not. And like for example, in AWS, uh, that, that's what they config services for. It's quite easy to just add your own rule. But in general, don't write your own evaluation logic. You'll you'll kick yourself later. Okay. High level architecture, this is what a central mediation service looks like. Event sources are on the left, mostly CS, uh, CSPM tools, some cloud events, really it could be anything, right? If you're running, uh, we're running some on-prem workloads in countries where that's the easiest way to be compliant with their local data tenancy laws, uh, you, you can send whatever kind of event from wherever you want into this system. We do it through webhooks. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But then within that system, there's, again, just the three steps. Check an allow list, fix the problem, do all your response, and train the user. Talking more about invent, event ingestion, uh, webhooks, magical. Everything supports webhooks. You can send any event out of any system through webhooks. I would be very, if you, if you have a system that you use that's even security related in any way that doesn't support emitting events via webhook, I'd love to hear about it because everything I could think of supports sending events out as a webhook. And they're super easy to collect, right? Every single low code platform, SIM, SOAR tool, or just you know, cloud service can, can ingest webhooks. And I will say you're going to want uh, so webhooks don't support complex authentication methods. As a standard, I always choose OAuth2 for authentication for APIs. You, you can't do that with webhooks. Um, so you do have to fall back to just API keys. You will want unique API keys per event source so that if you're looking at events coming in in the logs and saying, these events are strange, was a key lost, you would know which one you need to rotate with which tool. Um, and I want to point out there's no code in this at all so far, right? Receiving webhooks through Amazon API Gateway and sending those events straight into uh, EventBridge, th there's no code. You just click, 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 send it all through, good to go. Uh, it, it does the key checks as well. You don't have to write your own custom authorizer or anything. Uh, and this is what enables our event-based architecture is just that event bridge. Uh, check the allow list, right? The new purple box at the bottom there. So this is the first time we're writing code. It's about 10 lines of code, um, but that's where you'll keep a database. And basically, you just have sets of 
this specific resource is allowed to be exempt from this specific rule, and that, that's it, right? The, so it'll just check. The, um, when an event gets to the event bridge, it's sent automatically to the allow list lambda, which is, again, a platform as a function as a service, really. Um, does, it's serverless, doesn't cost us hardly anything per run. Checks against the database, which, again, I'm using managed services for, nothing to maintain really there. Um, and then if, if, it is, if it does have an exception, that's where the story ends for that one. Since it has an exception, done. If there is no exception and it is a violation, writes another event back into that event bridge. That's where you get you know, your event-based architecture throughout the rest of these steps. Uh, now for respond, the blue box. Uh, this is where you'll f do whatever response you want, right? You can do anything. You can, it, your response could be you know, terminate the resource, modify the resource, change some other mitigating control to accommodate for the misconfigured resource, you know, maybe add a WAF rule or whatever. Um, that's something we do. Uh, you will need an IAM role for that function to be able to go into wherever the violating resource is and, and adjust it, right? Or wherever your destination takes you. Um, so that's, that's still very simple. This is often just 30 to 60 lines of code for us in simple Python. Um, and of course, report back to the event bus that I have done something to this resource because of this reason. Which brings us to the last step, uh, train the user, right? Again, it's important. People will keep making the same, the same mistakes over and over if they don't know what they're doing wrong. So identify the user. We do it via CloudTrail. We do that separately just so we don't have to uh, embed it in every one of those lambdas, but uh, we have a separate service, just step function, just fi search CloudTrail, who touched this resource last, we'll, we'll email them, call it good. Uh, we keep all of our emails in just Jinja templates, the lambda, sees the event come in, grabs the template, renders it out, sends it an email, done. Um, so I, I will highlight though, those three lambdas, you will need one set of three per CSPM alert that you want to auto-remediate, right? Um, those are all unique to the specific alert. So what I, what I didn't show here, I simplified it quite a bit for the talk today, but uh, there's another listener on the event bridge that sends every event that goes through it to our SOC so they can correlate against all their other alerts coming in. Uh, we have a few, we call them core services, things that live outside of this that these lambdas can use for their own convenience, right? Like the user identity service, identifying users, that, that's a core service. There's a few other ones like that. Uh, we do write back to our CSPM tool to say, you know, using their APIs, which are super easy, they all have one, just to say, you know, you can dismiss this alert, you can snooze it for two weeks, you can close it or retest or whatever the, whatever the tool wants. Uh, we just do that as a sort of abstraction layer so that as we push and pull CSPMs out of this whole process, we only have one set of code to adjust instead of all the lambdas. Um, checking the database is actually, it's, it's a third, it's a third party server, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a separately hosted service that we use just for simplicity's sake. Um, and then I will highlight as well, a lot of what these lambdas do are all the same, right? It's a very similar function. So we put all of that shared code, we call it an SDK, put it in the lambda layer, which is shared across the three of them, and then you just call functions that already exist in each of these lambdas, which keeps their length very short and they're very simple to write. Um, and it will say, uh, sources from cloud events that are straight on the event bridge, they bypass the gateway. They just go straight into our event bridge. That's just a built-in uh, functionality of, of AWS. Um, looking back six years, what it's been like to operate this tool. Uh, again, each, each Lambda is between 20 and I guess 80 lines of code. It's all Python for me. I've had two interns write and maintain basically the whole thing. Um, we automatically respond to 85-ish, plus or minus a lot, uh, alerts from five different CSPM sources. Uh, it costs $52 a month in AWS spend, plus the two interns' time. Um, 50 of that is just the database cost. Storage is a little expensive there. Um, $2 of which is like running the lambdas. Uh, I'd say our average uh, mean time to detection, or mean time to response, really, is 10 seconds. As soon as that alert comes in, it goes through the whole thing. Uh, the reason it's 10 seconds and isn't shorter is because often 
we have to wait for CloudTrail to catch up. There's often a 15 minute delay there sometimes, but uh, so within about 10 seconds is our average runtime from, from start to finish to response. And the metric I would be most proud of is the number of new misconfigurations identified and coming into the system is trending downward. And again, that's because we bother to train our users and tell them, hey, this is what you did, this is how we changed it, this is why, this is how you can prevent that from happening in the future. So again, back to the, back to the thesis, right? You can get value from all your CSPM tools by creating your own centralized identity, uh, sorry, automated remediation system, and it is easier than it sounds. Take value from all of these tools, which you already have, and start realizing it. Thank you. <laughs>